This is the video for the Digital Measurement System CTS-880. Uh, this is the desktop of the computer which runs the system. Here you will see a folder or a, sh a shortcut to a folder labeled VSM Data. If we open it, we'll find all our test results from the prior tests that have been completed on the system. We start the system by double clicking or right clicking and opening the VSM icon on the desktop. You will see the system will load its files and it will initialize. And it will present us with the test setup table screen. Since this is our initial startup, the test setup table will be of no use to us until we perform the calibrations. So we will close this screen and we'll go to calibrate. Here we will see several options on the left hand side which are not grayed out, which means we're able to use them. All of these calibrations except for the rotation angle should be done each time the system is turned on and periodically if the system is left on just to reinforce the calibration. Uh, the rotation angle is not necessary uh, unless you are using it frequently and you find that the set value versus the value displayed on the rotation mechanism is starting to go off. On this screen you will notice that the Current calibration constants are displayed. These will be affected by the various uh, calibration functions which we will perform. The only ones which do not change the calibration constants that are displayed are the Gauss meter and the sample position because those um, are done with pots and micrometers and those uh, values are stored within the micrometers and pots physically respectively. All calibrations are to be performed after the system has had adequate time to warm up to prevent drift from the system warming should allot for two to three hours. If you leave the machine on it's not as necessary to wait because it will already be thermally stabilized. The first function which we will perform is the Orsted's display calibration. This is an entirely automatic process. The machine first attempts to offset to zero Orsted's for the program field. What this means is it's trying to determine what set point it needs to give for the measured field to be zero. If you're looking at the front display now, you'll see that it's getting closer to zero. So after testing several, several different settings, it'll determine which one is best and then keep that one. Now you see it's going to the 10K Orsted set point, and it'll do the same to ensure that 10K is 10K. Once it is completed, it will exit as you've seen. That's the end of that one. The sample position calibration is only necessary when the dimensions of the sample holder have drastically changed or the sample type has drastically changed. Your uh, dimensions of your sample have changed drastically whereby the center would be shifted along the Z, X, or Y axis substantially you would want to do the sample position calibration. Otherwise, it's unnecessary. The X detector coil gain is another calibration function which needs to be done 
when all the others are done. In this one, you will make sure that the EMU of your standard is put into this box prior to hitting continue. Once you're ready, hit continue and the system will automatically do the calibration. Using the known EMU for the sample, it will set the saturation field and then calibrate the EMU per volt. And then it's complete. You may move on to the next one. The final test is the detector offset, which you should do prior to starting your samples when you have new sample holders. The detector offset will <coughs> basically subtract the effect of the magnetic field caused by the sample holders from your sample when you measure your sample down the line. So it's important to do this. It's one of the methods which got rid of the symmetry problem uh, along the x-axis in the samples. I picked plus sat and minus sat because the book refers to them as having properties which would again reduce the symmetry problem across the axis. This is another test which is automatic. as you see it completes and brings you back to the calibration screen. At this point you can close the calibration screen and we can move on to the measurement. To start testing we simply <coughs> clicked on setup on the main screen there and it came up with our test setup table. The first step is if we do not have a, if we have a setup file already to load the setup file. In this case, I will choose the BASF because it has the parameters that we had agreed upon for our testing. Up here you will see that hysteresis loop is selected. We have a full loop, six segment, symmetrical. You see all the choices there. And then using that information, we have hysteresis loop, three or six segment. We have a six segment, so this is the one we want. If we want to check the parameters, we just click on it again, and our parameters come up. <clears throat> You'll notice that the start field is 10K, so the first step is from 10K to 1500 in increments of 250 Orsted. Our second step is 1500 to negative 1500 in steps of 100 Orsted. And then our final step is negative 1500 to negative 10,000 in increments of 250 or said. Down here you'll see we have averages set to 5. As you had thought, it will take 5 samples, average them, and then record the data point. I selected 5 because it took some noise out of, this, out of the test. 1 will be a bit more noisy, 10 will be a bit less noisy. the more sample averages, of course, the longer the test time. We say not to exceed 100 for two reasons. One, the test time will be very long. And two, the benefit of noise reduction is great really, greatly reduced when it's greater than 100 for the test time. Do not forget to set your mass. Up in the upper right, we have test identification. 
if you looked at the test uh, files which I gave you, this is where I put the information that said the etch time at 100C. Note under the file name, that's where I put the 14022 underscore 5. You have a limited amount of characters in the file name, so it would be best to put additional information in the test identification field because you're allowed more characters there. And I spelled standard wrong. There we go. You notice our current setup file is BASF. You should leave the save test file and save measure parameters checked so that you could refer to the parameters later and of course it'll save all the information after the test. Now one more thing before we go into the actual test is test parameters. These parameters will show up on your report and most of them are based on measured values some are calculated based on inputs such as the mass and the volume. Down here is the list of the ones that have been selected. And as you can see, there's a large list of ones to choose from. Simply click on one, hit add or insert. You can adjust the geometry of the sample here again used in some calculations. If you want to change the units, you may. Okay. Math functions, you see EMU empty sample holder correction. Recall from the calibration screen that we did the offset calibration. This is the direct <coughs> result of it those numbers are used to offset it. Once we are satisfied that we are ready and all our parameters are set, hit start test and the system will begin. As you can see, the first task that the system performs is the auto-ranging of the EMU based on the saturation point of 10 kilo Orsted. The graph that is displayed is based on the parameters which we put in. Since we put a match, max field of 10K, the graph will be balanced uh, symmetrical at 10k per side and it will be <coughs> on the y-axis it will be balanced so that the maximum can be easily seen. I do not have a sample on at the moment but the empty test holder uh, which we use for the <coughs> offset calibration so this test is not going to be of any importance to us Notice the elapsed time, the percent completion down here. Notice the field change and the EMUs with it. Temperature is displayed, though we are not using the temperature monitor. And the angle is set to zero degrees. I'm going to stop this test. We'll go on to data analysis. Let's assume now that we have completed our sample run. We hit close and go to analysis. Our sample data would be in here. So to de demonstrate the features of this, I will open a previously run item. Here's one from the other day. Notice our test parameters, which we had selected in the prior step, are displayed here. All of our sample points are located on this graph. And we can go through each point individually by using the slider on the right hand side. You'll notice X will change and then the, the Y value or EMU will shift accordingly. 
So right here we have 4.84 <clears throat> times 10 to the minus 3 EMU at a 6K field. Here's our test ID, which we put in last time. This is where we could change the graph parameters, but when we change them, it'll cause symmetry across the line, so you can't do 0 to 10K. You have to do whatever it is that you prefer the upper hand to be, because it'll display both sides of the graph. The same applies for the y-axis. It will reflect it in the opposite side of the graph to keep symmetry across the axes. There are several math functions down here which can change the graph and the data significantly and are for you to decide they're useful for you or not. Whatever happens, you can do and you can go and hit the restore button to restore the graph to its original its original data. Note our mass is up here. Our volume we didn't change our area, so they're just standard values. Any test parameters that are based on them would need to be you would need to make sure that you have these values in. Okay, so where do we find our test data. Well, we don't want to exit the program because some of the values for calibration are not retained. So the best way is to hold down control and hit escape. Go to programs in Windows Explorer here. And go to desktop and then to the VSM data folder shortcut which I provided. If you hit open all of our sample runs are in here. This computer is currently equipped with a floppy drive. In order to save to the floppy drive without closing the program, you can simply right click on one of your samples, send to 3.5 inch floppy when you have a 3.5 inch floppy in there. The file will be written to the disk. That is how I have transferred the files to you for processing. When you're done, simply close the Explorer program and you can come back to the VSM program without having to close it. Once we are done with the program, we can just quit it. And we're on our desktop. And again, here's our VSM data folder, which has all our samples.